Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, connecting with thought leaders all around the world. This is a Cube Conversation. Hi, I'm Stu Miniman, and this is the Cube's virtual coverage of AWS Summit Online. Happy to welcome back to the program to help give us some insight into what's happening in AWS last week and today. That is Corey Quinn. He is the cloud economist at the Duckbill Group. Corey. I know it's always One a pleasure many, to see me. Thank you is very it always much, a pleasure Luther. to see you? No, it is always a pleasure to see me. Thank you for once again exhibiting remarkably poor judgment and inviting me back onto your program. <sighs> yeah, okay, you know, Corey, yeah, you've been on the program a few times now, including at some of the AWS shows, uh, AWS San Francisco, AWS New York City, you know, reInvent, we see you, uh, but this is the first time, you know, we, we've had you on online. So give us a little bit about, you know, what that, the impact of uh, the, the, the global pandemic has been meaning to you, and more importantly, what you've been seeing from our, our dear friends at AWS. Sure, uh, the fact that I'm not traveling anymore and spending almost all of my time at home means that I'm a lot closer to the edge when it comes to the content I put out because I no longer have to worry about someone punching me in the face. But other than that, from a business perspective, things tend to be continuing on much as they have before with, of course, different customer concerns. The more interesting question from my side has been, what is the effect this is having on people? Because yeah, we're working from home remotely. It's not really a fair test of how well you can do remote because I've been doing it like this for years. And there's a there's a sense of existential dread that's hanging over people's heads, more so than usual, more so than right before the AWS reInvent keynote, you know, when you're wondering if you're about to have your entire business put out of business by an AWS competitor. Now it's just that, that sort of dread that never goes away because they won't deliver the keynote, if you'll pardon me of using a metaphor. Yeah, it's been really interesting to watch. Uh, you know, Corey, of course, I mean, Amazon is, you know, a, a big player in the industry before this. Uh, Amazon, one that gets talked about a lot in the news. You know, Amazon overall, you know, when this first hit, they announced that they were hiring 100,000 people. Then they went through that faster than anyone could believe. You, you know, you think about having to hire everyone remotely. Uh, you know, my joke was, you know, Alexa, please screen everybody and hire everyone. Um, but then they hired another 75,000. And it's not just the warehouse and uh, the Whole Food people, because I've seen a number of people that I know getting hired by AWS too. So, uh, you know, you talk, it's all about the people that, you know, the number one focus, of course, during the pandemic, people. How's Amazon doing? What feedback are you getting uh, for how they're doing? Well, I don't have too many internal sources that'll confirm or deny things of strategic import because it turns out that I'm generally not cleared for those things. Who knew? Uh, something I'm picking up on across the industry has been that if you're building a hyperscale cloud provider, you're not looking to next quarter. The investments you make today aren't going to be realized for three to five years. No one is currently predicting a dramatic economic impact that's going to be felt for a decade based upon the current situation. So yeah, AWS is still investing in people, which is always going to be the limiting constraint. They're still launching regions. We had two launched within a week. Uh, past month. And we're still seeing a definite acceleration, if anything, of the pace of innovation, as AWS like to say. Now, from my perspective, that's both reassuring that some things never change, and of course, the usual level of depression, where, oh, good, there's still more services to learn what they do, learn how the names work, find ways to poke holes in their various presentational aspects. And of course, try and keep the content relatively fresh. There's only so many times you can make the same joke before people start to complain. Yeah, absolutely. And Corey, you bring up a really good point. You know, Amazon, they, they have a long strategic plan there. If they're, you know, building new data centers, they're building uh, the, the power infrastructure for these things, it's not something that they're going to change on a dime. They plan these things out far in advance. And AWS does, of course, have a global scope. Um, you know, I really, you know, wonder, you know, from an operational standpoint, are there any pressures on them? Uh, you wrote uh, an, an article, uh, you know, relatively recently talking about one of the other public cloud providers that has had to prioritize certain customers and uh, even had some performance issues. Uh, AWS seems to be, you know, running through this, dealing with the capacity. Uh, you know, I've had phone systems that have problems. You know, everybody has, uh, when they're working from home, contention internally even if you've got a gig bandwidth uh, when the entire neighborhood uh, has children on you know, the, the classrooms online for video, uh, there's pressures there. So 
uh, you know, Corey, it seems from what I've seen, you know, AWS uh, operationally is running well and, you know, keeping things uh, all up and running. Is, is, am I missing anything? Not at all. I mean, the, uh, the, as AWS is fond of saying, there's no compression algorithm for experience. As I'm fond of saying, that's why they charge per gigabyte. But what that means is that they've gone through a lot of these growing pains and large disruptional stories in 2010 through 2012. EBS outages causing cascade failures as everyone saturates links as they roll from region to region or availability zone to availability zone. They understand what those workloads look like and what those behaviors are. And they've put an incredible amount of engineering into solving these problems. I think that anyone who looks at this and, and doesn't see this happening is in a very fortunate place because we don't have to. It's approached utility uh, level of reliability. You don't wonder every time you turn the faucet on whether water is going to and we're now at a point of seeing that with AWS resources. Now, there are still going to be recurring issues, and there have been basically since this thing launched. A particular instance size and family in a particular availability zone of a particular region may be constrained for a period of weeks. And that is something that we've seen across the board, but that has less to do with the fact that they didn't see this stuff coming and plan appropriately and more to do with the fact that there's a lot of different options and customer demand is never going to be an exact thing to be able to predict. We are seeing some customers dramatically turn off capacity and others dramatically ramping capacity up. It comes down to what is the nature of this current pandemic on their business. Yeah, well, th this absolutely does put, uh, you know, some of those promises of the cloud to test. I should be able to spin things down. Uh, some things I should be able to turn off. And if I have to, you know, shut down pieces of my business, I should be able to do that. Um, I, I'm curious what you've heard on changing demands out there, Corey. Um, you know, on the one hand, you know, customers, they're, they're pre-buying, they're getting reserved, and they're making sure that they can, you know, optimize every dollar. But when something like this comes up and they need a major change, you know, are they stuck with a lot of capacity that they didn't necessarily want? Sometimes. It comes down to a lot of interesting variables. For me, the more interesting uh, expression of this is when companies see demand falling off a cliff as users are no longer using what they're uh, what they've built out, but their infrastructure spend doesn't change. That tells me that that's not a particularly elastic infrastructure. And in fact, when people are building elasticity into their applications, they always interpret that as scaling up rather than scaling down. Because the failure mode of not scaling up fast enough is you're dropping customer requests on the floor. The failure mode of not scaling down fast enough just means you're spending extra money. So when you see user demand for an environment cut by 80%, but the infrastructure cost remains constant, or the infrastructure usage, depending, that's a more interesting problem. And you're not going to have a lot of success asking any cloud provider for an adjustment when, well, okay, you're, you're suddenly not seeing the demand, but your bill remains the same. What, what is this based upon? You need to actually demonstrate a shortfall first of, wow, you know how we normally spend a million dollars a month? Well, now we're spending 200 grand a month? Yeah, about that. And once you can do that, there are paths forward. I have not yet heard stories about, frankly, any of the big three cloud providers absolutely hanging customers out to dry in a cloud infrastructure context. I have heard whispers about, for example, with G Suite, where they're not willing to, and this, this feels like a very dark, way to go, but I'm going for it, where, well, we just laid off a third of our staff. Can we get a break on the annual licensing for those seats on G Suite? And the answer is no. That feels like it stings and is more than a little capricious. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, one of the things uh, that the underbelly of SaaS is, you know, oh, it should be elastic like cloud, but oftentimes you're locked into a one or your contract. And if all of a sudden you find yourself with needing half the demand and you call them up, you know, are they going to give you that break? So, yeah. <laughs> you know, price and Corey, you, you, know, you, you know better than yeah. most, so. All right, let me spoil it for you. Every provider is going to give you a break on this because this is a temporary aberration as far as the way the world works. We are not going to start seeing global pandemics every year, I hope. And when this crisis passes, people are going to remember how their vendors treated them. And if it's, well, we held your feet to the fire and made you live up to that contract, that sticks with people. And it doesn't take too many stories like that or people pulling lawsuits out of Pacer to demonstrate that a company beat the crap out of them to say, huh, maybe that's not where I want to make my sizable cloud investment. Yeah, uh, so we're absolutely. Find out. So Corey, how about, you know, there's there certain areas where I heard, you know, certain groups 
that maybe were slow rolling cloud and all of a sudden realize that when they're working from home, they can't go hug and adjust their servers that are saying, oh, geez, maybe I need to hop on this. Uh, then there's other services. You think, you know, VPN usage must be through the roof. Uh, workspaces, you know, when first announced, you know, many years ago was a bit of a slow roll, had been a growth uh, area for Amazon for the last couple of years. Uh, are you hearing anything specific to new services or in increased growth in certain services like I mentioned? There are two patterns that we're seeing evolve. One is the traditional company you just described, where they build out a VPN that assumes some people will occasionally be working from home at a 5% rate versus the entire workforce 40 hours a week. That, is, that, model, that model is straining everything. Whereas if you go back for the last 10 years or so and look at a bunch of small businesses that have started up or startups that have launched, where everything they're using is a SaaS service or a cloud service, then there is no VPN. I don't have a VPN, for example. The fact that I have a wireless network here at my house and I'm at this location, there's, this IP address isn't whitelisted anywhere. The only benefit that this network has over others is that there's a printer plugged in here and that's it. The identity model of I authenticate to these services via API credentials, via username and password, via, I don't know, enchanting something and they send an email that I click the link, that, that winds up handling the authentication and identity piece. And there's no bottleneck in the same VPN direction. I feel like this is going to be the death knell for a lot of VPN-centric corporate IT art. All right, uh, Corey, one, one of the other things about AWS is they don't stop. And what I mean is, you know, you talked about them always being online, but you know, every week there's new announcements. It keeps feeding your newsletter, it keeps feeding your feed, you know, uh, everything going on there. How is number one, you know, the announcement train uh, from AWS going and anything specific, uh, you know, John Furrier was, uh, you know, interested in, you know, Amazon AppFlow, uh, something that was, you know, released relatively recently. Mm -hmm. The problem with a lot of these new services that get released relatively recently is that it requires time to vet out how it works, how it doesn't work, how it should have wound up being uh, implemented to solve your particular use case, or in my case, how they could have named it better. But you're not able to come up with those things off the top of your head the first time you see it, because it's irresponsible at scale to deploy anything into production that you don't understand its failure cases. Right now, with everyone scrambling, most companies are not making significant investments in new capability. They are desperately trying to get their workforces online and stay afloat and adjust the very rapidly changing economic climate. And oh, they built a new data store or something of that nature is not going to be the sort of thing that gets people super excited in most shops. That time will change, but I do feel a bit of pity right now for a lot of these product teams who've been working away on these things for months or years, and now suddenly they're releasing something into a time when people don't care about it enough to invest the effort that it yeah, you whether, bring up a really good point, uh, Corey. Uh, you know, there are certain things, if I was working on a project that was going to help me be more agile and be more flexible, you know, I needed that yesterday, but I still need that today. Um, some other projects, you know, might take years to roll out. Uh, you know, AI wow. is uh, a technology that, uh, you know, has been growing and maturing over the last couple of years, or, you know, IoT solutions are a little bit more nascent. So is, is what you're thinking, it's a little bit more stick to your knitting and the solutions and the products that you're leveraging today and some of the you know, more visionary and futuristic ones uh, might be a little bit of a pause button for the next couple months. Exactly. If you're looking at exploring something that isn't going to pay dividends for 18 months, right now the biggest question everyone has is, what is the long-term repercussion of this going to be? What, what is the year, what is the world going to look like in three years? And because that's where a lot of these planning horizons are stretching to. And the answer is, is look, when I wind up doing a pre-recorded video or a podcast where I talk about this stuff and it's not going to release for four days, I'm worried about saying something that it's going to be eclipsed by the news cycle. I worry on my podcast recording, for example, that I'm going to wind up saying something about the pandemic. And by the time it airs in two months, it's, oh, look at this guy. He's talking about the pandemic. He doesn't even mention the meteor. And that's the place right now where people are operating from it becomes much more challenging to be able to adequately and intelligently address the long-term when you don't know what it's going to look like week to week. Yeah, absolutely. For our viewers, when you hear my segment on Corey's podcast and you wonder why we didn't talk about Murder Hornet, uh, it's because we missed that one-week window that we are in right now 
when we are talking about Murder Hornet, uh, not when we recorded it, not when we released it. So really good point, Corey. Um, talk to, you know, Corey, you know, data is one of the most important things. You've done a lot of, about, you know, data portability, you know, all the costs involved, cloud, you know, Amazon's trying to help people, uh, you know, with, you know, bringing data together. Uh, you know, I said in one of the interviews with Andy Jassy a couple of years ago, um, while customers were really the flywheel uh, for AWS for a number of years, I think it is data that is that next flywheel. So I'm curious your thought as how, you know, enterprises think about their data and AWS's role there. Incorrectly, if you want me to be blunt, there's an awful lot of movement, especially as we look at AI and machine learning to gather all of the data. I've been on cost optimization projects where, wow, that's an awful lot of data sitting there in that S3 bucket. Do you need it all? And I'm assured that yes, all of the sales transaction logs from 2012 are absolutely going to be a treasure trove of data just as soon as they figure out what to do with it. And they're spending large piles of money on this, but it's worse than that because it's not just that you have this data that's costing you money, that's almost a byproduct. There's risk to an awful lot of forms of data with regulation that continues to expand. Data can become a toxic asset in many respects, but there's this belief of never throw anything away. That's not really ideal. Part of the value of a sane data management strategy is making sure that you can remove all of the stuff that you don't absolutely need. Right now, with AI and ML being where they are, there's this movement toward, oh, keep everything because we don't know what that's going to be useful for down the road. It's a double-edged sword. And enterprises are, at this point, not looking at this through a lens of, this thing could hurt me, so much as they are, this thing could possibly benefit the, the our business in the future. All right, so Corey, uh, I, I've really noticed over the last few months, uh, you've spent a bit more time talking publicly about some of the other clouds that aren't AWS. So, you know, while we are covering AWS Summit online, give us what you're hearing from, you know, Microsoft, Google, and, and others, you know, any strategies that are interesting to you, any, you know, customer movement uh, that, that is worth mentioning. Sure. I think that we're seeing customers move in the way that they've always been moving. Um, people made a bit of a kerfuffle about a blog post I put out with the extremely clickbait title of, Zoom chose Oracle Cloud over AWS, maybe you should too. And there were a few there were a few conclusions people drew, understandably, from that particular headline, which was, for example, the idea that AWS had lost a workload that was being moved from AWS to Oracle. Not true. It was net new. They Zoom already has existing relationship with uh, both Azure and AWS by their own admission. But the argument, the, what, what I took that particular change to be, in my case, was an illustration of something that's been bugging me for a while. If you look at AWS data transfer pricing, the publicly posted stock, which again, no one at this scale is going to pay, it is over 10 times more expensive than Oracle Cloud. And what that tells me is that I'm now sitting here in a position where I can, I can make a good faith recommendation to choose Oracle for cost reasons, which sounds nuts, but that's the world in which we live. It's a storytelling problem far more than it is a technical shortcoming. But that was interpreted to mean that, oh, Oracle's on the rise, AWS is in decline. Zoom is a very strong AWS customer and has made public commitments that they will remain so. Right now, this is what we're seeing across the board. You see Zoom doing super well. They're not building out a whole lot of net new either. What they're doing is building, is just desperately trying to stay up under crushing unprecedented demand. That's where the value is coming from right now of cloud's elasticity. And they're not doing, oh, you know, we're going to go ahead and figure out if we can build a new continuous deploy process or something that, that makes on-call a little bit less brutal. That's not what anyone's focusing on. It's here, wow, this boat is sinking if we don't stay up, grab a bucket, start bailing. And that is what they're doing. The fact that they're working with every cloud provider, it shouldn't come as a surprise. Yeah, well, it, it's interesting. I, I'm thinking about Zoom, and one of the things that I've been watching over the last couple of weeks, everybody has, is you know the daily updates that are happening related to security. Um, mm -hmm. You know, think back, you know, six, seven years ago, Amazon had this is our security model. We're not changing it for anyone. Now, you yeah. know, Amazon has a much more flexible and nuanced, uh, you know, security position. So there yeah, are I, still I wonder, thin violet yeah. principles that Amazon will not and cannot shift. So to be clear, they have different ways of interfacing with security and different ways of handling data classification, but 
they're not the rules that you knew are not changing. It's not well surprise now suddenly every Amazonian who works there can look through your private data. That none of that is happening. I just want to be very clear on that. Yeah, no, you, you're absolutely right. It's more you know right security you know getting more attention even than ever, and it was already you know coming into 2020 before everything changed. It was one of the hot topics. Corey, you know, I'm curious, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at a virtual event for AWS. Have you been to some of these? You know, are you getting burnt out from all of the online content? Um, I'm, I'm sure everybody's getting tired of you. So are you getting tired of everyone else? I don't accept that anyone would ever get tired of me. I am a treasure and a delight. But as far as online events go, I think that people are getting an awful lot profoundly wrong about them. For example, I think that people focus on, well, I need to get the best video and the best microphone, and that's the thing that people are going to focus on, rather than, maybe I should come up with something that someone wants to listen to. People are also assuming that the same type of delivery and content that works super well on a stage for 45 minutes is not going to work when people can tab over to something else and stop paying attention. You've got to be more dynamic. You've got to be able to grab people's attention. And I think that people are missing the forest for the trees here. You're just trying to convert an existing format into something that will work online. In the immediate short term, everyone is super sympathetic. It's not going to last. People are going to get very tired of the same tired format -y tropes. And there's only so much content people are going to consume. You've got to stand out and you've got to make it compelling and interesting. I've been spending a lot of time trying to find ways to make that work. Yeah, uh, uh, I had a great conversation with John Troyer. He said, you know, we can learn something by watching some of the late night talk shows. Uh, you know, I think there, there's a new opportunity, Corey, to say there's a house band. Uh, you know, you have a small child at home, give her a tambourine, there's your house band. You know, you can have a lot of fun with it. <laughs> oh, absolutely, especially during a tantrum. That's going to go super well. I'm just going to watch one of her meltdowns uh, about some various uh, innocuous topic. And then I'm going to wind up having Toddler Meltdown, the Amazon S3 remix. And I'm sure we can wind up tying it back to something that is hilarious in the world of cloud. But I'm trying to pull off a little bit longer before I start actively exploiting her for internet points. I mean, I'm going to absolutely do it. I just want her to get a little taller first. All right. Well, Corey, I want to give, give you the final word. Uh, AWS, uh, the online events happening, You know, give our audience the, what they should be looking at uh, when it comes to their uh, AWS estate. Cool. Uh, as usual, pay attention to what's coming out. It's always good to have a low level awareness of what's coming out on stage. But don't feel you need to jump in and adopt any of it immediately. Focus on the things that matter to your business. Just because something new and shiny is announced on stage does not mean it's a fit for you. Doesn't mean it's not, but remain critical. I tend not to be one of the early adopters in production of things that have potential to wind up causing challenges. And I'm not saying, oh, stay on the exact old stuff from 2010 and nothing newer, but there is a bit of a happy medium. Don't think that just because they release something that A, you need to try it, or B, it's even for you. No AWS service is for everyone, but every AWS service is for someone. All right, well, Corey Quinn, always a pleasure to catch up with you. Thanks so much for joining with you, joining us. Thank you, Stu, as always, for suffering my slings and arrows. It's appreciated. All right, thank you for watching, everyone. Uh, lots of coverage of the Cube at the AWS Summit online. Check out thecube.net for all the offering, and thank you for watching.